Seattle a few times, as you may have seen, as I've sort of been on the road doing this one for this is my third time, which, as Umbraco talks go, is very, very rare, because normally it moves so fast that I have to keep throwing it away every two months. Uh, but this one, I've actually got to reuse, like I say, this will be my third outing for it. And if the Glasgow lads get their way, I'm probably going to go up there and do that up there as well. So maybe four, in which case I might need a separate slide to fit it all on. So the first time I did this was at uh, UK we uh, U West Fest in Vegas, baby. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's contractually obliged you have to have baby on the end of Vegas whenever you talk about it. And uh, if you haven't been, I will do a shameless plug as well. It was really good. Uh, it's a bunch of geeks talking about Umbraco, which we all love, otherwise we wouldn't be in this room, right? In Vegas! Come on! Why weren't you there? I was the only uh, European to go over, which floored me. I thought like 50 of us were going to descend and kick Vegas up. And then it was just me. So I ended up by the end of a couple of days talking really funnily. So I started saying cash and, and route and things like that when we were talking about stuff. And I had to smack it out. And it took me a couple of weeks when we got back to start talking good old Queen Ings in Queen's English, which apparently this is what that is. Um, and then I did uh, uh, Umbraco Manchester as well. And I wasn't meant to talk here. I didn't want to talk here to this, this time. I, just, I actually want to come and just watch. So I don't know if you've noticed, but when you do a talk, you end up just polishing slides for an hour or two and missing a lot of the presentations. But uh, at Manchester, Ishmael was there and he said, you, you need to come down and, and do this talk because I'm going to talk about killing code first. Uh, thank you. Woo! Once and for all, uh, hopefully slaying the beast that is code first. Unfortunately, I've got a slight confession. At this very event, Two years ago, I started the code first thing. <laughs> I stood up and I said, hey, there's this new thing called Usight Builder, and you ought to play with it. It's really great. And everyone went, wow, that's really cool. I'm really glad you talked about three. I'm going to play with that. Two years later, I've done a complete about face, and I go, for God's sake, stop doing code first. It's horrible. Because uh, on the face of it, it is great. But as you get further into it in a live project, as opposed to just something you're playing with over a weekend, it really does want to bite you in the ass, as we're about to find out. So bear with me while we go through a slight journey of what Code First roughly is, why we think it's a good thing, and why we really want to drink the Kool-Aid and think it's ace, and then equally why it's actually a terrible thing and why you should never, ever do it. Uh, that's kind of where we're going to go. So to start out with, I'm just going to remove that cursor because it's going to really annoy me. Um, things you should know. I am not, yes, please. Uh, I am not a stupid coder. I'm a pragmatic developer, thank you very much, and, um, and a professional. And um, <laughs> So on the next 40 odd minutes of this, you guys, you've all come to a, to a coding talk, right? And it's quite a hardcore one, so I'm assuming you're all coders yourself, no coders, or at least have got an understanding of it. So I'm not going to, the safeties are off for what we're going to be talking about. We are going to be talking about code, you're going to follow along. There are no live code demos, it's just the old screenshot, we're okay. Um, but what you need to know in the back of your mind is, Pete's quite smart, you know, he's all right. What you need to not have in the back of your mind is, ah, he's just not thought it through. He's, he's clearly overlooked something. He's clearly not as smart enough. Right, I'm, I'm, not, I mean, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but equally I'm no dunce. So I want you to know that I'm a pragmatic developer. And of course, because I did this talk in Vegas, they all think we drink tea all the time, which actually I do. Uh, but uh, they drink, we drink tea like this, which is fantastic. And as a point of proving uh, my pragmaticness, in the office, we started drinking a lot of tea because we're coders and we code with tea and that's what we drink. And we got to the point where we were getting up and making tea maybe every 15 minutes, which meant we were losing quite a lot of time waiting for the kettle to boil, which was getting a bit annoying. Now, there's two options. One is buy an urn, you know, them big silver ones that are on all the time. To be honest, we're getting large enough now where I'm actually contemplating that. But at this point, I thought, well, maybe there's a better way rather than constantly going up and making tea. Maybe we can fix that. And the way I came up with that, being pragmatic, was to get bigger mugs. <laughs> if you can hold more tea, you need to boil the kettle less. Yes. Trouble is, I've now got six of us, and we're now getting to a maybe needing two kettle boiling situations to make a full round, which in itself is causing a problem, hence my desire for an urn. Um, this is a unicorn mug. I, this actually exists. We got sent six of them by the beautiful guys at Mindfly uh, for a project we did with them recently. Uh, and this was a lovely thank you, completely out of the blue. Uh, which, which were great, and as discussed earlier today with one of the guys from Mindfly, the trouble is, is James, our creative director, is actually left-handed. And so if you imagine picking this up, left-handed, you end up trying to poke out your right eye with the unicorn horn, um, which isn't best. And also, two of our developers do the washing up. They're clumsy as fuck. So <laughs> it is only a matter of time until this is a headless cup. Uh, but, but what can we do? 
So what is code first? Uh, it's a bold statement. Some people like, like yeah, everyone likes to assume we all know, but I'm going to give us a quick rundown um, of, of roughly what it is. So it's the desire to use code, C sharp in this case probably, uh, to lay out what our Umbraco build ought to do. So that means including things like uh, put your doc types in. So if you've got a frequently asked questions doc type, then you want to define it via frequently asked questions class maybe and write some bits out. And then you might want to add on that there's a title and there's a question and there's an answer and who posted that question. We can add that onto our doc type as well through property types, which themselves might have a class to describe that this is a frequently asked questions picker class. And as a result, that will describe what that might have on it. Macros? Sort of. Why not? Why on earth should we have to create a macro and then go in the back end to then click and round to say we want to do something? Wouldn't it be nice if you could do macros in code first and you could do those too? Uh, even our templates. Why, why the heck not? And the MVC, this is all a lot easier. Uh, but uh, remember, two years ago, MVC wasn't out then. Yeah, we're talking before, old school. Uh, so you could have done your templates as well. Or you could, basically, you just want to try and do everything in code. And at no time do you want to put any content in or actually talk to any clients or, or see any real people. Everything wants to be done in Visual Studio at all times. That's the general idea. Um, and the reason we want to do this is there are many, many golden promises uh, said about code first. It's a desire in all our, de our developer hearts that this must be right. It feels right. I want it to be right. The promised land. And this is the promised land. We can source control our doc types. Now that's an issue because in Umbraco, everything's in the database. It's one of the biggest grumbles at the minute is why the hell is it in the database? I, if it was out in the database, I could source control it. If you've somehow a nice file somewhere and then you can make a change and then somehow Umbraco would magically know about that change and that would be great. But because it's in the database, it's just uh, uh, it's horrible to get it out. So it's hard to do. So Doing it in your code and then somehow automatically allowing that to modify the database means we can actually source control what our frequently asked questions doc type actually looks like, for instance. Then you've got ease of deployment. Because it's in your code and it's a DLL, the theory is upload DLL to live server, new frequently asked questions object then suddenly magically becomes available on your live server. Wasn't that swift? That was nice and easy. Because the other way that we do it is we add a new checkbox and then we have a piece of envelope from whatever today's letter that came through the post was, and you write on the back of it, added checkbox, called this, deploy to live. And then when you actually go to put it live, you have to try and find said envelopes. There may be several at this point, because the client delayed it, because the knob. They went, no, we're not quite ready for it to go yet. Even though we said it's very urgent, it had to be done by tomorrow. We delayed it, it's now going live in three weeks. So in three weeks time, when you push that knob live, you have to remember where that envelope is, and then go through the, the things, and go, uh, checkbox, right, click, 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 uh, checkbox, yeah, that's brilliant. You don't do that first time, though. You deploy everything, and everyone goes, the site's broken, and someone goes, oh, yeah, need to add a checkbox. Can't remember what it's called, hang on. All right, so that, that deployment cycle, there's a good nod at the back. That was a very enthusiastic nod, that's good. It's not just me. So ease of deployment is, I've added it into my code. I've compiled my code. I have uploaded my code. I'm sounding like Roger Moore at this point. I'm uploading my, my code. And automatically, the next time the website starts, which you would do because I've just deployed my DLL, it will appear, and all is good in the world. Not quite, but anyway. Uh, you end up with strongly typed models. Uh, let's do one of those questions where it doesn't really matter what the answer is. I'll continue anyway with whatever I was going to talk about. But who is a big fan of strongly typed models, and who isn't a big fan of strongly typed models? So we'll go for who likes strongly typed models first? Oh, that's probably less than I thought. All right. Who's a really, really good fan of not particularly bothered about using strongly typed models? So of course. Oh, that means that, that's not 50 50. That, that means there's a good chunky who either can't be asked to put your hands up, and that's okay. Who can't be asked to put their hands up? <laughs> <laughs> and equally, there's another part you're like, I have no idea what he's on about. So, strongly typed models is you want a class that you create in your Visual Studio that has all the fields on that you might have. So, as we discussed with. Uh, uh, I think that question is a really rubbish one. I suppose it's all right, isn't it? So you'd have a, a questions property. So you, in, in, in theory, you could say uh, my doc type dot question, and that would come up in Visual Studio. You go, yes, this is good. And it makes your templates read a lot easier. So rather than read things like uh, model dot get property, angle bracket string, close angle bracket, open curly brackets. Oh, it's not curly brackets, it's normal bracket. Uh, quotes, uh, question, close quotes, close bracket. A little bit verbose. <laughs> Instead of doing that, you can just do dot question. And it kind of, hmm? This, this is verbal live coding, voice activated coding. 
if, instead, you can avoid that sort of nonsense. Instead, you can just uh, do strongly type models. They're great because you can add on bits that isn't necessarily in your doc type. So you might have like name, which is all fine. And then you might have a funky one like mobile friendly name, which does some funky things like concatenate it, throw a few bits away and put dot, dot, dot on the end or something. Uh, now that can be part of your class. It's nothing to do with Umbraco. It's just a, a helper that you've got on there on that particular model. And so they're quite handy to have for that, our strongly type models. And so it's kind of a thing that we kind of like. You also get to keep it dry. That's also, also very important. Rather than have things that you're having to do in the UI, like pick an icon and change a description and everything else, Said you put it all where you want it to be in that class. So you've got your question, you've got your answer of your frequently asked questions. You've also got, this is the question of your frequently asked questions. You can put that in there, because it's all together in one. And we like that, because we're coding. Uh, easy development cycle. I'm coding in Visual Studio. I compile. I go to my browser. I press refresh. Magic happens. Isn't this good? Feels smooth, right? We're liking this? Like all within Visual Studio, because we don't like leaving it. Even though there are a million one tools, the awesomeness is being made on Node. We don't use any of those things because until someone comes up with one that works in Visual Studio, I'm not interested in it. Uh, because it's, it's just not in Visual Studio, it doesn't exist. So if you follow along with this kind of stuff, then this is roughly the kind of thing that we're going to start building. So we have a, we try the laser that never works. Oh, look at that. So you have some class that you've created. Isn't that awesome? Oh, no, you're, you're inheriting from that because that's always the thing with these code first stuff. You, you can't just create your own class. You have to inherit from a class and do whatever you're going to do. Uh, so we have to inherit from some sort of class We've created one called blog post here, nothing to do with frequently asked questions, which is the example I've been using for the entire presentation, and therefore you've completely lost all context. Uh, we've added our title on there, which is a string, and we've got some rating for our blog post. I don't know why you'd rate your own blog post anyway. And a publish date, and that one's really important. I like putting that one in, because A, it shows that there's a time and a date, and B, it also shows who's made the mistake of assuming, I'll just use the create date on the blog post, and that'll be all fine, and then render that out in the template, and then you actually have to do an import at some point. And then all your blog posts from the last three years, and when you redo the website, have all been published today. And then your boss turns to you and says, well, those dates are kind of important. Can you go back and add them all in? You go, no. <laughs> I used the create date. Well, surely you poked it into a, some sort of storage temporary variable while you did it. No. Well, just rerun the import. Can't. The one off. I thought we'd only do it once and threw it away. Oh, dear. We've all been there. See? Not naive, me. I didn't make that mistake at all. Once. Maybe twice. Ah. So th is this the dream development cycle? Edit your C-sharp file, compile, refresh the browser, repeat, winning. This is where we want to be. This is where code first is meant to be. Is this feeling about right? This is kind of lots of nods, goods, all. That is where we want to be. This, this should be achievable, right, with the new APIs that are out. We should easily be able to do this. Piece of this. Thank you, Stefan. That was good nodding. Is it real within a Braco? Not really. It's not very clean to do that in a Braco. You, it is possible. And this is one of the points that we need to talk about. So this is what it actually feels like when you do try and do code first with a Braco. Are you ready for this? Has anyone done it yet? Has anyone had play? We've had lots of people playing with it. How many here just because they've heard a bit about it and they'd like to hear a little bit more about it? Oh, do you want? Come on. Have I, have I, Put arms out already. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, seven, five, five odd people have had a good go. But this is all right. So you edit a C sharp compile uh, file. I'm skipping over the fact that you've had to go to source control, pull down the latest, get the environment all back. We'll just ignore all that. Uh, you have to then compile it, refresh in your browser. You go wait for Embraco to boot up. Takes a while, doesn't it? It's not Embraco's fault. It's doing a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff. Then you've got to wait for your code first framework of choice to sync up as well. And that does, does take quite a while. Doesn't at first, it certainly doesn't in the little videos that they show you when they go, hey, I've created this thing and here it is and here we go, let's watch it. And now you just watch and there it is. I've added a field and it's peered. Isn't that fantastic? That's right, because they've only got three doc types in their database. When you get up to, I don't know, 132, as we had on one particular project, I know, excessive, uh, that uh, you then start refreshing this thing and it takes 22 seconds, 22 minutes actually it was, and then it times out. And then you have to rerun it again. You, you literally, we're going to make cups of tea. I reverted back to small cups. It was taking that long. I thought, I've got time. I can do a couple of boils. It'll be all right. And uh, the sync thing worked. Now, why did the sync take so long? The reason the sync takes so long is you've got code, and then you've got the Umbraco database. And Umbraco actually doesn't give two hoots about your code. Your Umbraco database only cares about what's in your database. And the only way that your magic in the middle bit of glue, called uh, your code first framework of choice, can actually 
mirror the two up, is to go through everything in the database and check it against your code. It's not clever enough to go, oh, he's only added that property. I'll just add that property in the database. There's no way for it to do that. So instead, it loops through everything you've got in the database and comparing. This, as you might imagine, takes a while. Because whenever they say, oh, it talks to the database, that means danger, right? When everyone says, oh, this code's very slow. It's doing a lot of hits to the database. That's a bad thing, right? And so if you're having to, on startup, hit the database, every single property, every single doc type, for every single whatever else you want to do, it, it just scales exponentially. And before you know it, your three doc type template that look really cool on the demo works because you don't notice it. Because it is doing a lot of work, but it's so fast you don't notice it. When you try and do it on a live site, please hold, you end up with um, just astronomical amounts of time being lost on the spin-up. You keep waiting, and then you get an error. <sighs> Could have done without that. <sighs> Typo. And then you repeat. And it might run the next time, but you've again lost 20 odd minutes waiting for that typo to take effect. Uh, and then you smash things like the Hulk. I watched uh, Assemble Avengers the other week, I've not, not seen it for the first time on Netflix. And, uh, and there's a lovely bit where he says, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this. And Hulk, smash. And that's the only thing he says to him. Hulk goes, oh. That's me when I've been doing this sort of stuff. It's, it's not pleasant. Um, so this is kind of what you end up doing with. So that, we had that beautiful version. We went, isn't it clean? Isn't it beautiful? This is how it all should be. This is how I want to code. I'm with you. That's how I want to code too, but it's not reality. This is actually kind of what it ends up looking like. Uh, so this is, uh, again, a pseudo made up uh, a bit of code of what code first class actually ends up looking like. There's an awful lot of noise on here. Uh, you can do some clever things. Look, you can use require. Oh, that's quite good. So we're using MV, uh, MVC and .NET stuff to do magic for us. You have to put in title in. That's quite cool. We have to describe what the description is. Put that in as a great big long piece of text. We have to say all this meta shit up here that we don't really remember, and the guys who do all the demos online for the thing they wrote that weekend, because they're really awesome at writing a code first framework, they don't tell you about these bits either. Uh, they tend to skip over them. They're all doable, don't get me wrong, uh, but it, they think it's a bit boring telling you about these bits, so they just, uh, just skip over it. But it's metadata that's required, because the back end that your editor's going to look at for the next three or four years while they're doing this stuff, they need to know what the description is. They need to know, they need to have a nice eye, shiny icon. And in V7 now, they can have some lovely nice colors to go with the icons, which is very exciting. Uh, but all that stuff needs to go in there, which is lovely. Then they've got, oh, this is a bugger. Allowed templates. You've got to do a great big long string of query, se uh, comma separated stuff of everything that's allowed in there. Everyone forgets that one. And then allow children exactly the same. That's a great big long query string. Oh, it's so smooth and easy to write this stuff. It's fantastic. Uh, it's a load of crap. So we don't really like doing that. The trouble is, we come back to a point I, I touched on earlier, is we, we're now suffering. We're about to go in the realms of the naive programmer. Uh, which we've all gotten is because we're developers. If we are, didn't have the naive program, we wouldn't be able to do anything. This is the programmer who thinks Stack Overflow is basically two database tables, one full of questions, one full of answers. How hard can it be? Could write that in a weekend. Peace, piss, mate. Right? You look at stuff, you go, I'll nail that in about three hours. Two weeks later, I'm so sorry. I know, I know. We're losing so much money on this. But it was just like a shoot from the hip kind of. Estimate. So that's what the naive program will end up doing for you. We've got to kind of avoid him. Um, the next bit, he's going to be striking in the back of your head saying, he's doing it wrong. He's just not thought it through. I want you to listen out for him. He's going to be in there. Or her. Uh, just, just keep an ear on him. Um, also, uh, no, keep that. Uh, so naive, I, I'll look this up, means having or showing a lack of exper experience, judgment, or information. And you're making judgments on how to make code first now, and the rest part of this, this talk, when I've already, I've, I've got the thousand yard stare, right? I've, I've been down there, I've done it. I'm not saying it's not possible, and that's a dangerous line, because now your naive program is going, oh, so it is possible. Careful, see, he tries to trick you, he's wily. Uh, I'm just saying it's not fucking worth it. Thank you, Mr. Mark Dixon. Uh, it's just not worth your time to go down this route. So here's the, some of the problems we've got with it. You've got a slow dev cycle, which I, I loosely, uh, described before of make a change, recompile, wait, <laughs> all these sort of things. It gets in the way really, 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 really massively. Uh, a, a good example of that is back here a little bit. I purposely made a typo just here, a new bug post. 
so the dev cycle for fixing that when the client spots it, you can't go in the UI. Oh no, you can't just go edit the template and go, I'll just change that in the text box and say uh, blog post, nice and easy. Because the next time you run your sync, which is the next time your website starts, it's going to blitz it and it's going to put this in because this is actually the fact that this out trumps anything you've got in the database because other without that it, you wouldn't be able to update anything so <laughs> whatever you've written in code out trumps so you change blog in the ui you then rerun this website and it's going to kill it and put it back to bog now imagine yourself as a client and you spot this thing you say uh it's very it's a very lovely site so far but i have noticed you have called it bog not blog it's a bit embarrassing about to show it to the boss can you fix it you go no problem fix it in the ui as a quick hack and then the website recycles before the big meeting that she's going to go to. And she goes, looks at it, and she goes, it still said bug. I look like a fool. What are you doing to me? Confidence plummets. Everyone's worried. It's a very bad sign. All because your workflow is fucked, because you're, you're trying to do this sort of stuff wrongly. So instead, what you have to do is pull it from source, compile it, make a change. Sorry, make a change first, then compile it, push it up, run it on live, um, and then all sorts of works, and then you all get there. And everything's fine, but that's uh, a bit shit that because that's all for a typo, that's not all, all that great. Uh, you get an awful lot of noise in the code as well. Does anyone think this is clean? A lot of noise in it, my brain can't really comprehend what's going on there. I'm not seeing the wood for the trees, and so I'm really against all the attribute nonsense that you've got to add on to this sort of stuff. I'm trying to avoid it as best we can. How are we doing, Tassie? Uh, UI metadata is required, which I described. You've got to put description, icon, or something. It doesn't belong there. It's, we're meant to separate the front end from the back end, right? But yet we've just mashed the two together in that, in that file. It's not really the right place to be putting nice little helpful bits of text. It's too easy to lose data. So like I said, I said you, and then you've got to run it on live and did that. Because you run it on live, you just got to hope it works. If it doesn't work and it gets halfway through, what state is it in? What has it done? Let's say it stops halfway through. How much has it actually done and how much has it not? And how sure can you be that you're about to do it? Let's say some bloke who doesn't know quite how the whole system works goes in and changes the name of one of your properties. Is it going to remove that property from the database and delete it? Or is it just going to remove it off the doc type? It's still in there. It's still got content. It's fine. It's just you can't see it. And when you log in, you're going to have a heart attack because you've now got a new text field that you've added, which has no data in it at all. And unbeknown to the naive guy who added it in, the client's paid someone to go in and fill all this content in, and now this particular field's empty. And they, they thought they were just helping you out, and now you've lost it. How do you get that back? Now, there are ways, but still, it's not really what you want to do on the morning of launch when someone thinks you're being helpful, and you've pushed it all up, and you've lost all sorts of stuff. So it's a bit too easy to do that. Uh, how do you fix when it goes wrong? I've sort of touched that. You, you don't. You have to put your waders on and go into the database. It's a very scary thing to be doing. Uh, you've also got this massively hard-coded third-party dependency. Now, we don't mind some of those. We've got one of them in there already. It's called Umbraca. Um, so, you know, some of these you just got to do. But another one called .NET, that's okay too. Um, but you need to ideally limit the amount of those that you're going to put in. Uh, Usite Builder, which is the one that we use quite a lot, when we put it in, it was all, all fine and dandy when we were running it on V4, and then V6 came out with all the new APIs, and basically it broke. It wouldn't work because it was built just to tame V4, it wasn't built to tame V6. We started going through and we started, well, we'll just update everything, should be, shouldn't be too hard, it'll be fine. There's no tests for it. There's no way of knowing what it actually is going to do. And the APIs actually start returning different stuff. So then we started leaving it alone and hoping that would work, but actually V6 made a change that completely goosed it, so you had to do something. And we ended up then with six or seven of us in the community were all trying to make V6 work. And none of us really knew how, because it's, hey, it works on my machine. Are you confident to put that into live then? No. <laughs> no, I'm not sure whether I'm prepared to push this up and let everyone else install it and say, this is the V6 version and it works. It's a bit scary to do. And sadly, the guys who wrote it as well, they didn't have time to do, to do it. They got very, very busy. That's uh, Vega, Vega IT in Russia. Uh, they did a great job with it, but they didn't have the time to test it and get it all better either. Um, so you need to ask yourself whether you really want to put that in. And that's just you site builder. There's an awful lot coming out. Well, let's be honest. There's one coming out one a week at the minute uh, with these um, frameworks. And it's kind of getting a little bit annoying uh, because they're written in a weekend and then there's no follow-up. And I don't know what everyone who's releasing these things is trying to think. I'm going to write this, this will be great. People will then install it. And then people are asking me for support questions and reporting bugs. How dare they? I wrote that in a weekend as a bit of fun. I can't believe they're actually using it in production. Uh, but people do. So you need to be careful what you're about to put slap bang in the middle of your website. Uh, oh, yeah, I did this one. 
smash things. Uh, this time, I added the source. So that was to change to my typo. Got the new slide out. All for a fecking typo. It's not a good workflow, that, is it? It doesn't feel quite right. It's an incredibly long-winded way of doing it, when what you should do is just log on to the site, live site, if you want, and change the text box, because we know that works, because uh, the Embracker boys have done a very good job of just making sure that back-end editor actually does what you want it to, uh, which is very good. And let's say something actually goes wrong. So what? It's going to say, oh, I didn't save it because something is locking or something. You go, ah, I know what that is. But what it's not going to do is, might have saved it, might not. Uh, pair, cover your ears, unless it's courier. Um, so this workflow is broken. Code first does not fit in Umbraca. Now notice how big I've made that. <clears throat> are, we, are we drimming this home hard enough? I really, I'm, I've got a mallet out back. I can bring it in if we really need to. Uh, yet we keep getting a new framework, and I don't know why. I don't know if anyone else has any ideas why. I think it's down to just the developer itchiness, the naive programmer is getting a little bit carried away and going, oh, these APIs, I can make my own doc types. I should be able to do that really easily. I can make a class with attributes. I can pull all this stuff out. And before you know it, oh, fantastic, look at this, it works. I've got a frequently asked question, three-page demo. But it doesn't do any of the other stuff. And that's the problem. Code first 80% doesn't work. It needs to be code first 100%. It's that last 20% that's causing all of us an awful lot of headaches. View site builder got as close as anything I've seen, and I still don't now like it. <laughs> I think it's not, not quite the rule. But I also say, whenever I talk about view site builder, I'm not slagging it off. It is a phenomenal body of work for taming v4. But the trouble is, what's the latest version of Umbraco again? Seven. So, but sadly, it's not kept up. Uh, v, uh, you might be saying, well, what about um, uh, view site builder 2? I hear that's coming. Uh, yes, it is, but it's going to suffer from all the same problems. Uh, it's not fixing any of the problems, it's just using new APIs, and that's not really necessarily giving us what we want. So, uh, what is it then? Why do we keep being driven to make these bloody code frame first frameworks? Why are there so many of them? What is it we're trying to fix? And we think it's down to, we want to pull those doc types out of the database. We want source control. We want strongly typed models. Are we just scratching an itch? Because we can. Naive programmer again kicking in. Uh, I think the first two, there's nothing we can actually realistically do about those, with the exception of Usync. Does a, does a bloody good job of doing it. But I think any further than that, it's got to be done in core. But to do that, if we're honest, it means a complete massive smashing to pieces of a huge m amount of Umbraco core code that's never ever going to get done. Because a whole of Umbraco is built around putting everything in that database. So then suddenly go, Oh, now it's all going to come from a file. I can't see how they're going to do that overnight. So it's a massive ask to say, we want this stuff, we want you to do it, and really ought to be done in core. It's a common problem. It just gets thrown over the fence. Of course you should do it. But realistically, looking at the body of the code that we've got, I don't know how core can fit it in. It might be going on the roadmap soon, later, year, or two years, or whatever, but it's not going to be any time soon. So we can't rely on it. So that bit's still causing us some trouble. I think that's one of the drivers for all this code first stuff. Strongly typed models we really like. You can still have those without a code first solution. You can make an MVC model. That's what the M in MVC is all about. It's just a class. You've just got to populate it somehow. So we can still get strongly typed models. So it's not all that bad. It shouldn't be the sole driver of having to put that. And if you've got strong models that document what all your properties are, then in effect, you're kind of also documenting what's, what, you've, what you're already putting in, in your source control. You're documenting what's already in Umbraco. If you've got a frequently asked questions model and it's got a question and answer on it, then you know that somewhere, probably in Umbraco, there's a question and answer text field that you put somewhere. So we're kind of getting source control through our models as well. So again, do we really need this code first stuff? I'm struggling as to where, where the heck it's coming from. I think these bottom two have got a lot to answer for. And again, that's back to that naive programmer. I've, I've got the APIs. I can play with this. I can do this stuff. And I really bloody well want to. There's also other bits. Gold Rush. Me standing up here saying it's really hard and no one's cracked it yet to a certain mindset goes, a challenge! I love a challenge! I shall be the one who shall climb the mountain and I shall take victory for my company or myself by working night and weekends to try and come up with something. And you may achieve it. Some of those out there, some of these problems out there have been done. I'm not saying I'm absolutely totally against Code First. I'm just against all the Code First solutions I've seen so far because they do not work. It may be possible to do it. And this is dangerous. I'm lighting the blue touch paper for the naive programmer here. But I highly recommend it is not bloody worth your efforts. We could have got a cure for cancer with the amount of hours that we've burnt on Code First. 
So what can we do? It's an incredibly negative chat so far, but I'm just drumming home. Stop fucking doing it. <clears throat> Alternative. You Site Builder 2, I've already mentioned, it's not released yet. It was in beta. Uh, a very clever guy who you're probably using lots of his stuff, Mr. James South, had, uh, posted loads of tweets when he first had a go on it saying, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, what's this all about? Uh, and I had a look at it and I went, yeah, I'm not going anywhere near that one. That's fine. It's coming. It may be fantastic. It may be gay, but I'm not going anywhere near it. That doesn't mean you shouldn't but you shouldn't. Uh, maybe Core will do something. Core are really, really busy doing Core things. That's what Core do. Core aren't going to fix this because it means literally cutting Umbraco in half, throwing half of it away and starting again. And we know what happened last time we tried that. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> there's a lovely thing called Umbraco Code Gem, which I blogged about, uh, which is in alpha and still in alpha. And the last time I blogged about it, I said, this thing's really cool. We should have a go at this. And as a community, we should all chip in and help this guy out to make it absolutely awesome. And no one helped. And it's not moved on a job. Uh, this one re was really cool because uh, I'll just briefly describe how it is. Are you ready now? We're going to like go into sort of like a bizarre time travel movie moment where your brain's going to feel like it's gone in a blender. So we have a wonderful thing called Use Sync uh, by Mr. Kevin Jump over there. It does one job and it does it very well, which is to take what's in your database spit it out into, into config files. And as a result, you can then deploy your config files up to live, and it will then poke them back into the database, which again is getting us an awful lot of the way towards what code first is meant to be doing. But one of the bits that was missing is, well, I want the models. I'm sick of making the models that match that thing. Wouldn't it be nice if there's a way we could automatically generate those models from, well, I don't know, using config files. I don't have to poke around the database. Instead, I can just watch this, what, what the config files are doing, and then spit out a class off the back of that, which would be quite cool. And then I'd be able to, I don't know, maybe compile down my classes to maybe spit out you, you, com, you sync config files and then poke those in and use that as the middle layer to be able to poke the stuff in. So you sync then became the magic glue, the mag auto magic source that makes me and my C sharp classes go into Umbraco and back out again. Uh, sort of like weird cranking the handle backwards or forwards depending on which way you wanted it to go. Um, it sort of worked. It was, it was probably the, the closest we could have got to, to fixing it for what we had. But again, it's gone nowhere because one bloke wrote it over two weekends. He's a very clever fellow. It's called Lars or something. Or Lars what? Lars Elba. All I know is he smokes like a chimney. Uh, <laughs> uh, you could go T4 template route, which lots of you talk about. I don't know why. They're mystical to me. I don't quite get them. Um, I have, I've never got my head stuck into why I'd want to write languages in another code for another language using another template that will run something all in Visual Studio. Because if it's not in Visual Studio, it doesn't exist. Uh, you could try the next homebrewed weekend built offering. Uh, there was one on uh, you Hangout a couple of months ago with Warren. And the guy was on there, and he, yeah, I'm going to show you how to make a three-page demo site really fast using what I'm going to do. He got round the warming up issue. You know, I talked about 20 minutes to warm up the, you have all the syncing. Because rather than scan all the DLLs and stuff, you had to put uh, the classes that you wanted actually poked in in a string that said, sync these up and only these up, please. Thus greatly reducing the async time. But even during the demo, he forgot to update that once and then lost a couple of minutes while he debugged what the heck we was on. It's, it should be there. I don't know why it's not working. It should be, oh, hang on, I've missed the string. How much time are we going to lose by doing that? It's just not a good workflow again. So that's not, not the best way of doing it either. So what can you use if you want to do this kind of stuff? I've, I've, I've touched on a lot of it, kind of just trying to sum up a little bit. Uh, you can use a shared da database for development as opposed to standalone. And whatever anyone adds, that goes in. That's all nice and simple. Lots of us are probably doing that already. You can use the UI for designing doc types. Now, there's a great man, fabulous man, who's about to take a fantastic picture of me mid-pose. Uh, called Mr. Douglas Robar. And when I went to, uh, I was at Vegas, by the way. I don't know if you know. But when I went to Vegas, uh, on the plane over, we, we were discussing this presentation. And you said the wonderful line to me, which was, you know, if the UI for editing doc types didn't exist, someone would create it as a package, and it would be the most upvoted package ever, because it would make editing UI really, really easy. And I went, you are absolutely right. Why are we trying to break that and write it in code, when in fact there's already a perfectly good solution for adding this stuff, and it is the current back-end UI. Now, we're all aware it could do with a little bit of work, especially now with all the Angular, Angular magics all there. You kind of think, this could be so much better. But it's not for now, but it's still bloody good enough. It does the job. And I can knock out a doc type in about three minutes. Click, click, da, 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 done. That's probably faster than I can do it by typing all that bloody square bracket garbage we saw earlier. Why bother? 
Yeah, but I get IntelliSense and Visual Studio. I don't care. I've got a checkbox. It's really easy. <laughs> what more IntelliSense do you want? It's a drop down list. Oh, and the, the other irony is when you do do code first and you go, I'm adding my checkbox in code first, I'm recompiling, I'll then go to the UI to see if it's actually poked it in. You're using the damn thing anyway. Stop kidding yourself. So uh, you can get a lot way, uh, of all this code first stuff by just having a good base page or a base build. I'm sure a lot of you, if you've built enough sites, you start going, we should start wrapping this up into one site. You know, We could make a lot of savings in time rather than keep building it all the time. And you end up with a nice little base build that's got most of the clobber that you want on there. Not too much fat. You want just the bare bones, that, all that stuff. And you can save a day or two from just installing that thing and booting it up and off you go. You get so much more from that as well. You get consistency. I know, for instance, on any of our builds, I can go model dot page title, and it's going to give me the page title, which is the H1, by the way. It's not the browser title, because we've got another one that says dot browser title. Yeah, avoid that confusion. And that's there, and I know which one's going to go where. I don't have to worry about anything. So a base page can get you 80% of the goodness that we're trying to talk about, these gains, these time gains of having to build all this stuff. You can hand code your models. I discussed this briefly earlier. I love hand coding models. The reason I do is rather than let a machine sort of crank it all out for me, which we're thinking is probably the right way of doing it, while I'm writing out all my properties and things, and under the hood, all I'm doing is the getters and setters that just do uh, uh, content dot get property setting of blah, and I put magic string in for whatever it is. And that's all it is, just a wrapper. But while I'm doing it, I'm thinking through what that object actually is, what it represents. And new properties that I haven't thought about will come to me while I'm doing it. The naming of those properties, I actually think about. I think, well, how am I going to use that? You know, you're actually spending time doing it. It's not just donkey work. You are actually chewing through how you're going to use that. You go, actually, that's going to need a child collection under it for something else. I'm going to have to create a child collection. That's a new doc type that I hadn't thought about. You actually then start designing that. And you only really get that by actually doing the hands-on time. It's a little laborious. It takes, what, 15 minutes, 10 minutes to do a class? Oh, end of the world. But you end up adding so many bits. So I quite like doing that. If you think about it, if you were trying to do it code first, you'd be doing that anyway. You're basically building exactly the same thing. You just wouldn't be cutting uh, get property uh, value all the time. Uh, Usync is awesome. I don't use it a lot, though. But it is awesome. No offense, Colin. I've used it twice on two sites. And for those two sites, it's worked really, really well. You've just got to remember to get your setting right for do you sync, don't you sync. Get that wrong. But it's possible. So it's okay. Um, it's great. If you haven't never checked it out, please check it out. It does, again, 80% of what we're trying to get from Code First without the humongous problem of Code First. It does break the rule of massive third party dependency, though. But it's okay because everything that goes wrong, Kevin's really fast at jumping on it and fixing it. At the moment of pride, whenever the, a new version or a new API change comes out, Kevin's the first one on the, on the Google groups to say, Oi, you've broken it again. Stop. How do I fix it? And then, and then he gets on and he gets it out. So he's very swift with the support. So getting fancy, if you want to go a little bit step further, you can use all these fancy things called mappers, which basically, given what we've got in the, in the database for Umbraco, I wish you to put this into an object of some description, please. And there's a raft of them. And I haven't had time to play with all of them. But I imagine that everyone in this room, one of us, has had a play with at least one of them. So if you want to learn any more, we can talk about it. So hands up if you've used UMapper. There we go, two people. So if you want to know anything more about UMapper, those two folks are the ones to go talk about. Ditto. This man wrote it, so he best put his hand up. And Lee Kelleher as well, silver hair fox, can't miss him. Uh, he, he also wrote it, so you can go tap those two up if you want to know anything about it. I played with that. I like that one a lot. Basically, you go model dot as whatever your class is that you want to do, and it will then return you that class all populated up with all the things in it. Couldn't get much simpler than that. It's very, very good for what he's doing. You can roll your own, but we've discussed that, right? Naive programmer in you is, is, is oh, yeah, yeah, let's do Yes, he wrote one. We could write one too. Stop that. Just use his. Stop pissing around. You could use the hybrid framework, which is great. And it's been updated. I think the new one's out that's working really, really well with version 7. I haven't yet used it. Now, I know a man who wrote the hybrid framework, and he's in this room. I oh, might be doing the big great disservice of not actually watching. Me. But um, uh, J J J J I still can never do his name. Jevon. Jevon's the man. He's here. And you can catch him. He's from Crumpled Dog. Go catch him if you want to learn anything more about the hybrid framework. Or lots of other people. There he is. Uh, or lots of other folk. It's a good framework. It's a very good one to use. There's another one called Buzz Framework, which we use from uh, Rusty from Mindfly. It's a cut-down version of hybrid. 
without all the, uh, the bells and whistles for image manipulation and everything. It's just the model stuff. And he's put that in. That's worth a good look. We've used that on two projects uh, with Mindfly uh, in the last couple of months. It's worked quite well. Uh, Core, there's Stefan's model builder, which he's worked out in version two is now out, I believe. Uh, however, proving the third party dependency problem, there's no upgrade path from version one to version two, and version one had some breaking changes in it. There you go. Uh, and to his credit, he said, I know no way to fix this problem. <laughs> there's no way of going from one to two. I'm sorry, <laughs> which I quite liked. But that does mean that you are now stuck with a version one site if you built it the first one, and there's no way of getting up back up there. It's version one forever now. <laughs> no matter how much extra goodies get added, you're stuck. That's the same third party dependency problem. Uh, now, naive programmer in all of us isn't convinced I could crack this nut, I could do it. So I'm going to put some numbers on it. And again, naive programmer, I could have booted up Excel. Could have spent ages. In fact, I could probably have run a script and written that myself to make some fantastic 3D graphs. But being pragmatic, and remember, I buy big mugs to fix problems, I instead booted up Paint uh, and did this beautiful graph. Uh, so this is a standard project. This is break-even point budget. And this is a project that we did recently where we didn't use any code first at all. As you can see, we burnt the budget as we went along, and we delivered at about this point. And Everything's all good in the world. A rare thing. And then, if we go back, I don't know, 18 months, this is what an actual project was like that we did uh, with Code First, Usite Builder. And this was a project for £12,000. We, we actually chalked up on the timesheet something in the region of £26,000. And when I looked through what all that was, Usite Builder Wrestling, I think we called it at the end of the day, uh, that's time not saved by doing code first. That's time wrestling with a behemoth that you wish you'd never ever installed ever in your life, ever. And uh, if, if, if you know, the naive programmer isn't, isn't stopped by a pragmatic programmer standing in front of you saying, for fuck's sake, stop wasting time on this. Instead, hopefully the numbers will let you know, please stop wasting time on this. Any time you would save from not having a strongly typed model, from not having source control, from writing down on the back of an envelope and going, forgot to do my checkbox, is totally blown out the water by the amount of time you lose trying to implement a code first uh, framework in Umbraco. It does not work. The model does not fit. It's not Ruby on Rails, where it works very, very well because it doesn't have Umbraco on it. It just has a database, and you can poke whatever you like in the database because the ORM's built to do just that. This is Umbraco. It has a database, it has a schema, it knows what it wants to do, and it's not going to let you play with it. We have to jump through the, all the APIs to try and get it done that way. It's never designed to do the things that we're trying to bend it to do. And to get it to do the things we wanted to get it to do involves cutting it in half and throwing half of it away and stuff. And again, that's not going to happen. Are we all all right with that? I laid that on thick enough. So stop spending time on code first. Instead, go fix some bugs in core. There are not as many as there used to be. But there also are a lot of little fiddly little ones that you can dip into. If you've got an itch to do some code and you want to do some good, go fix some bugs. If you're really, really itchy, go do an Andy Butland and go fix a shit ton of bugs and add loads of goodness to it. Uh, write a new package. There are several that still me doing. Before you do so, though, I would greatly admire if you would, I don't know, at least ask around if there's a package already that's doing it. People don't seem to do that because they think everyone's going to steal their ideas. One or two might. But on the whole, someone will go, oh, that sounds just like this package that's been around three years. Can't believe you haven't heard of it already. But instead, what we do as naive programmers is go, it's a genius idea. No one would possibly have thought of it before. I'm going to spend all weekend writing it and then releasing it. And everyone will go, uh, doesn't that just do what that other package does? Shit. Shit. <laughs> Who's naive now? You couldn't even do a Google search to see if something might have actually thought about it first. Help with an existing package. Again, there are lots of them around. I've got this brilliant idea for a package. It already exists. Oh, but it doesn't quite work in the latest cut of 7.2 beta. Go fix it. Find out why. It's much better use of your time than trying to roll another code-first framework. Read a book. I quite like World War II myself. It's quite like finding out heroics and things. Just, just, just chill out. Co not coding's very, very good. So much so that you can spend some time with your friends. <laughs> Be friends and family rather than try and claim this glorious high ground of take a flag up with you and go, I am claiming this mountain of code-first for me and my company. Screw you, you arrogant titch. You haven't clacked, got it at all. 
Right. Uh, any questions? Come on, there must be some. Excellent. Job well done. Bye -bye.